Hello, I'm Pamela Goods, Associate Editor at American Libraries Magazine, and I'm happy today to be talking with Jamal Joseph, the author of the upcoming book, Panther Baby, A Life of Rebellion and Reinvention, about his journey as a Black Panther in his teens to becoming an Oscar nominee for his Impact Repertory Theater song, Raise It Up, from the movie August Rush. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, where do I begin? I just finished reading The Galley of your upcoming book, and I must tell you that there are so many lessons to be learned, especially for the youth of today. Is that why you decided to tell your story? Yeah, it actually is. Um, I <clears throat> worked with young people in New York and traveled the country speaking to high school students and college students, and every one of them uh, has a similar question in terms of uh, and it's, what was it like? What was the experience like of growing up in the movement, um, how did you become who you are today? So the book is written from that perspective, through the curious eyes and passionate heart of a 15-year-old who was trying to figure out the path to manhood as much as trying to be involved in the social activism um, of the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you begin working with the Black Panthers and why? Well, I was raised by a wonderful adoptive grandmother, Jessie Mae Baltimore, uh, who made sure that I was active in the church and in the NAACP Youth Council. So there were conversations at the dinner table, um, in church, uh, in community groups about what was going on in the black community, what was going on in the world. So I had that, that sense of purpose and that sense that, um, that our lives mattered more than just what was going on personally or with your family. Then when Dr. King was killed, um, there was an, uh, there was a, there was an outrage in the community, but there was also an attraction to what we had been seeing and hearing on television and in the streets and on college campuses from the Black Power Movement, from people like Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown. One day I'm watching TV and I see the Panthers storm the state capital of Sacramento in their Panther uniforms with guns and making this articulate and passionate and bold defense of why black people should have, have the right to bear arms. And I said, I want to be that. And it was almost like watching um, a, a favorite sports team or a group of guys that just seemed very, very cool. And to be frank, it was the coolness and the badness of the Panthers that first attracted me, combined with that rage that Dr. King had been assassinated, and so maybe turning the other cheek and nonviolence wasn't the way. Once I arrived at the Panther office, um, again, you know, uh, feeling rage and feeling angry at all white people in general, I quickly learned that very day, that very moment, um, that the first weapon I would be given would not be a gun, it would be a book, and that that, that um, emotion of hatred and anger had to be replaced by a feeling of love for the community and a willingness to work hard for the struggle. And as you've indicated, much of your knowledge, yeah, much of your knowledge not only came from the streets, but your early interest in books. How important was reading in your development? Well, reading was very important in my development. I, uh, it, it, the, the value placed on education by, um, by Noonan, by my grandmother, um, was paramount. She made sure that I read. And, and by the way, this is a woman who herself only had a sixth grade education mm -hmm. uh, and came up from the South and worked very, very hard and was a domestic and understood the value of education in terms of the community improving itself and her grandson achieving his dreams. She made sure I read, she made sure I did her homework, she would make me show her homework, and um, would make and what she didn't understand would make me read it and explain it, wasn't embarrassed to say, we'll do this together. Um, so that was important, and, and, and I grew up going to honor classes and uh, you know being a smart kid. But I was a smart kid that kind of hung out with the bad kids after school. I was kind of like a puzzle mm -hmm. to my family. Still Why was that? Yeah. Still, still kind of struggling with that identity. You know, on one hand, you know, wanting to please uh, Looney and please, you know, uh, you know, Reverend Lloyd and other people who mentored me. And on the other hand, wanting to be a bad, wanting to be that bad, uh, that bad young person. And the Panthers, in a way, reconciled that for me. Because mm -hmm. the Panthers were tough. They were unafraid. But you studied. And here's what we saw in the Panther office related to books. And we're talking about books like uh, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, Solo Nights by Eldridge Cleaver, uh, Before the Mayfire by Lerone uh, Bennett Jr., 
but tough books to read and get through, like Franz Fanon's book, Black Skin's mm -hmm. White Mass and Wretched of the Earth. And here's what you saw. You saw people who thought that they understood what was going on in terms of social activism, world poli and geo geopolitics, come to, come to grip with, with, with a deeper understanding, having to study and really work hard. And then we saw people who could not read when they walked into the Black Panther office, learn to read and write because Panthers would tutor them. The first lesson would be that Panther 10-point program. And then you would see some people turn it into brilliant writers and public speakers who came in just knowing that they wanted to somehow be involved and were also given books and at that level were taught to read and taught to understand and interpret that work uh, as it was connected to the day-to-day -day struggles of the movement. Now that perception of the Black Panthers is, to me, little known. You don't hear that. You hear the violence part, but you don't hear the education part. Well, it was primary. It was the first thing that you encountered when you came into the, to the Panther office. And then the second thing that you encountered was community service. So I got a stack of books, and the next thing I got literally was a pancake spatula because the Panthers <laughs> had the free breakfast program. The Panthers had free health clinics. Uh, the Panthers had uh, legal clinics. And literally your day in the Black Panther Party was a day of service and work in the community. Um, if I had to put a percentage on it, you spent 95% of your work uh, studying, doing community service, and maybe 5% in terms of, you know, your turn of doing guard duty at the office, because by then the officers were being raided each night, and it, it was more of a protective uh, posture. But again, it's, it's easier for, first of all, for the media to get headlines. If they're writing about that 5% of the Black Panther Party, these people who dare to stand up against the system. Mm -hmm. And it's also easier for the government to attack you if they criminalize your movement. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when you look at the FBI memos that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were more concerned about the breakfast program and about the free books than they were about the guns. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, the period of history where the Panthers carried guns was actually a very short one because uh, uh, the Panthers carried guns in Oakland, California, where it was legal to carry guns. Those gun laws were, were quickly changed. Mm -hmm. And so in most Panther uh, cities, the Panthers patrolled the streets. They were unarmed. There were guns in the homes and the offices uh, because we had incidents like Fred Hampton being murdered in his sleep, Panther officers being blown up, the Panthers in Philadelphia, the men uh, uh, on the street at 1 o'clock in the morning stripped naked. Um, you know, exposed to the elements and, and indignities by the Philadelphia Police Department. So in that protective posture, yes, but in terms of the work of someone in the Black Panther Party, you walked around the Panther newspapers with books, with free food, with clothing. That's what you carry. Your arms were heavy, not from carrying arms. Your arms were heavy from carrying books and food and medicine to serve the community. Now, is there a particular library or a librarian that aided your growth? and that provided any particular guidance as you grew up in this movement? There was uh, the public library that was, a, that, uh, and it's interesting, I have a friend who grew up with me uh, here, uh, uh, who grew up with me in New York, who lives in Dallas now. Oh. And we talked about those days when it was a great trip to go to our local library up in the Bronx, uh, the Williamsburg Library, which was located on 229th Street. And we'd make that walk, and it was such a joy. I think it, it, we got the, the thrill that, um, <laughs> that, that kids, a few years ago when you still had Blockbuster and all of that, that was the way that you got your videos. Mm -hmm. People would make these tracks and come back with videos. And that's how we felt about the library and about books. And there was, uh, and they would let us stay and they would let us read and they would let us check out books and that honor system of returning the books uh, was an amazing was an amazing part of it. There was also school libraries like Mrs. Johnson that, that made us, you know, uh, feel at home in the library that smile and that reward system and that, and that elders in your family, even if they uh, weren't high school or college educated, uh, would have a conversation with you about what you read and what you understood. Um, and then there was those books that I read early that made me understand about the struggle for identity. There was Man, Child, and the Promised Land. It was the autobiography of Malcolm X. It was that thing of understanding what books and literature had done for young black men in struggle and struggle with identity in search of their manhood, in search of their purpose in life. Now, I noticed that in the book that you went from a public school environment to what might be considered private education at Harlem Prep. How did that affect you? Well, it was a great uh, situation. I mean, Harlem Prep was, was one of these schools that opened uh, in response to the lack of a miseducation that was happening 
uh, in the community. So it was a group of educators that came around. You know, now we call them charter schools or we yes. call them community schools. But there was this idea of community schooling that took hold along with the other programs that I talked about. For example, the Panther Party ran what they call a liberation school program. And that first started along with the breakfast program where we'd be giving out books and talking about black history to the kids in the school. And then it became a Saturday program and an after, an after school program. And then during the teacher strike in 1968, it became a program where parents brought their kids because parents felt like, well, maybe the teachers are on strike, but our, our children are not going to be on strike. They need to learn. Mm -hmm. So being in an environment was great because you felt like you were in an environment where you were really getting an education. And the Panthers, um, in their 10-point program, point number five was about an education. It says an education that teaches us our true history and our place in American society. Uh, I think we take it for granted now. I think in the age of Obama, where there is a black president and where we have uh, people who have made great achievements uh, in politics and in education and in sports, that we would take for granted um, that this is part of a kind of you know, the ongoing curriculum. But not so long ago, it was as, it was as if black people had, no, had made no contributions to American history. We're not just talking about black history, but to American history. That was something that was always kind of extracurricular. And if you just came up through the education system, um, you came up thinking that only white people had made a contribution to what was going on. So what did this do to your image when you looked in America? And, and in fact, what did this do to your image if you thought, if you dared to dream that you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or a college professor when you had no role models? And, 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 and also, often were not getting that encouragement in the classroom where people were saying, you tested really well and you might, you might be a good mechanic. I, I, in fact, that's what, that's what I had a teacher tell me early on, is that vocationally you tested real well, so you should go to a trade school because you might be very good at mechanics. Well, well the truth is, uh, is that I'm, uh, I'm now a college professor, um, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm a filmmaker, I do all of these things uh, fairly well, I'm a terrible mechanic. <laughs> it appears that one of the turning points in your life to accomplish writer, poet, and filmmaker was your involvement with the Actors Playhouse Ensemble. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, people had always uh, told me, uh, you, you know, because I love to tell stories and tell jokes, and uh, uh, people had always told me, oh, you should be an actor. And, and, you know, I figure, of course, you know, everybody tells everybody you should be an actor or you should be a writer. Uh, and then one day I was walking uh, by a theater, uh, a theater in Greenwich Village called the Actors Playhouse, and they had a sign, and it said, learn acting on stage. I walked in, and uh, the person, uh, Jack Ross, who ran the theater, was there, and uh, I told, told him that I was interested, and he gave me uh, a monologue on the spot to read. And I read the monologue, and um, Mr. Ross nodded his head, and he said, that was a very intelligent and sensitive reading. I'm going to let you into the class. <laughs> well, later on, I learned that if a German shepherd came in and barked those lines, he would say the same thing. <laughs> that was a very intelligent and sensitive reading. I'm going to let you into the class. So even though Mr. Mr. Ross was trying to fill his class, the education that I got as an actor was wonderful. And I did learn acting on stage with other actors. And it, uh, it actually planted a seed of a creative life that didn't come to full fruition until later. I was a member of the, uh, of the ensemble. I did a few plays. I learned a lot about theater. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be a full-time actor, but I know I enjoy theater. But it wasn't until a few years later um, until I was, when I was in prison, I was in federal prison. And some of the guys had heard that I had done some acting and some theater outside. And this wasn't on my kind of prison resume, you know, people <laughs> know, you know, this was a Black Panther and, you know, he was a Black Panther leader and a couple of people knew that I knew karate. I was a Black Belt before in a couple of tournaments. And guys came up and said, you did theater. I was like, how did they know that? <laughs> and then I got a little worried because I was worried like, theater, you know, is that, is that cool? Is that Maybe, maybe I'm going to lose my cred. That's not part of the convict code. But they was like, no, man, we heard, you know? And, I, and, and they looked real intense. And I thought I was going to get beat up because I did some plays. And it was like, and guess what? You need to do something for Black History Month. And I was like, okay. So I, you know, kind of, you know, uh, there were no plays. Oh, and here's the other thing. Speaking of my libraries, um, I got a job in the prison library. And so I went to the theater section. 
uh, because I had been charged with doing this play, and went to, and there was only one black, uh, there was only one black play in the theater section, um, uh, and that was A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. Well, truth be told, there were only two plays in the whole section. Well, <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, yeah, and, it, so, and, the and I read, the okay. and I read *Raisin in the Sun*, and I went back to the guys, and I was, I don't know if I can do this. And they said, Well, what's the problem? And I said, Well, this is a great play, but there's a lot of women in this play. And and they said, What? Well, yeah. And they said, Yeah, it's not a problem. I said, Look, you know, look around the yard, pick out who you want. We'll put a dress on. And I was like, well, I think, <laughs> I think, I think there's a better solution. And so I wrote a play. This is how I became a writer. I wrote a play that we could do. And then we started rehearsing. And uh, prison is a very dangerous and a very segregated place. Men segregate themselves. Not that the guards do it, the men do it. So there are sections of the yard and the mess hall and every place you go where people just stay together according to their groups. Mm -hmm. You know, the Latino prisoners, the black prisoners, mm -hmm. the white prisoners. And within those groups are these, you know, really strong gangs. Mm -hmm. And um, they never leave unless it's to do battle or... Uh, uh, you know, or maybe some business, some gambling, or something else. And here I am rehearsing with, with, with two guys, and into our rehearsal come two of the toughest Latino prisoners. These guys had killed a few guys since they were in prison, oh. right? It's like, I'm doing life already, you know? I'll take more time, but you want my license too? You know, so they came in, and now everybody is nervous, and we're kind of looking over our shoulder, we're trying to be cool and continue with the rehearsal. Because we think these guys have left their section of the yard. They've come all the way over here to this little room that they gave us near the library and the gym to do this rehearsal. Who are they here to kill? And sure enough, as I'm looking over my shoulders, uh, one of the leaders, Raphael, is looking really upset. Like he's really angry. And I'm feeling it. he's working himself up to really hurt somebody, to kill somebody. And about 10 minutes, he jumps up and he points at me. He was like, I got to talk to you, man. I was like, oh man, here, see, I knew it. I knew this theater thing was a bad idea. I knew it. Talk to him man to man tomorrow and just, you know, stand your ground, see what he. And he says, I've been here for about 10 minutes and I've been watching you, homies. And I really got to let you know something. That guy you're working with, that guy, that effing guy, <laughs> homies, he's not feeling his character. <laughs> oh, boy. So I said, well, why don't you get in and do it? And he got in and he was brilliant. So I rewrote the play. Then the blacks and the Mexicans started working together. Some of the white prisoners were like, what are they doing? One of the guys came up, tough guy, you know, a member of the Aryan Brotherhood or one of those Aryan organizations. Mm -hmm. He comes in, he joins. And so through the power of art, we created the only integrated part of the art. And how did that happen? It happened through art, it happened through literature, writing plays, the guys got interested in that and started reading other plays and doing other work. And that seed that was planted years ago was kind of on a dare, or just because I got people, uh, you know, um, tired of people nagging me, walked into a theater workshop, became something that became the discovery of my creative soul in prison, mm -hmm. and a way that I found that you could use the creative arts, that you can use writing, that you can use theater, that you can use film, not, not just to bring about social awareness, but to help bring about some social healing. And finally, what is the message that you're going to be leaving with the librarians here at the New Center Conference? The, 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 the power and the importance of using art, education, and mentorship as a weapon. How important it is. And how important the work that they're doing is. How wherever I went, books played a key role. And how wherever I went, even in prison, they were fighting to keep the library open and the importance of that. And people would come around on that book cart. And some of the men pushing that book cart, those book carts, were prisoners who were now in their 60s and 70s who had been in for 20, 30, 40 years. And you would come by and they would say, hey, young brother, you want to read this book? I don't want to read a book. And they would say, young brother, let me tell you something. You're here whether you like it or not. So you can serve this time or you can let this time serve you. And if you paid attention... The thing that came behind that advice wasn't a membership to a gang, wasn't a little, you know, joint, a legal, you know, a marijuana joint or anything else. It was a book. Um, so that very important weapon, and so that for, for people in 
the face of what we're going through, you know, when people talk about budget cuts, schools and libraries are the first to go. Prisons are opening up. We have uh, in this country state-of-the-art prisons and uh, middle-aged schools. When I say middle age, I'm talking about the middle ages, the dark ages kind of schools. That librarians and educators and mentors need to understand that this is important work, this is frontline work, and that they can't give up. They have to fight even harder. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much.